where I sit um, as at the International Association of Universities, I would say there are many different kinds of disruptive um, events and uh, occurrences and trends taking place depending on where one sits. I would have thought that uh, a major disruptive um, trend is what has happened recently in uh, the Arab world. I would think uh, disruptive times are the fact that we have um, we can no longer really talk about a uh, north-south divide in the world. We have a very diverse set of countries um, with emerging uh, economies playing an, a role they've never played in terms of internationalization of higher education. Um, we have a country like Brazil that launches a, one of the biggest programs to send uh, researchers and scholars abroad, 75,000 uh, uh, researchers will be going uh, abroad to study. So we, we don't have an east-west divide anymore unless we look at Islam and, and the rest of the world. And so to me, the disruptive times are that. How do we adjust <coughs> each of us in, in our various parts of the world to that? And I think that um, uh, what is happening here in the UK is very much conjectural. But I think uh, one of the major things that I learned here was that we can't really talk about a sector of higher education any longer. I, I don't see a definition. I don't see the parameters of a sector. I see a, a, a variety of institutions that, that um, together uh, create a provision of higher education and research, but it's no longer a sector. And I think that's one of the key major changes that is taking place. Thank you. Well, Eva's just uh, reminded us that in the world as a whole, there are huge disruptions taking place. Um, and we always have to bear that in mind. But I'll be a bit more parochial and uh, comment more on the UK scene. Uh, I think the situation is genuinely disruptive because although you can point to a great deal of change in UK HE since uh, the end of the Second World War, most of it has been of an expansionary nature um, and therefore I think reasonably easy to handle. You think of the university creation after the Robbins report, you think of the uh, ending of um, the uh, uh, system of polytechnics and universities and the uh, creation of universities and generally there were more resources available. I'm not saying more resources per capita, there were challenges and there was a difficult period in the uh, 80s in the Thatcher, Keith Joseph period of austerity. But what I see has happened now in the UK is we've had a very big expansion of higher education. I think we'll have greater expansion in the future, but it's going to happen uh, against very, very substantial cost pressures. Um, if you think of the, not only the movement to students having to borrow to pay. Um, some people have made the point that this is perhaps overstated because they don't necessarily have to pay back if they graduate and have low earnings throughout their life or if they graduate and emigrate. But I think what we're going to see is what they're already seeing in America, which is a large cohort moving into their 20s and 30s and 40s with accumulated student debt. And uh, that's going to become a very big political issue. I don't think that generation will just accept that debt. I think they'll contest that debt. And politically, there'll be pressure for write-downs and various other things. And all of that, I think, will feed back in a rather unpleasant way to uh, the funding of universities and that the residual state funding that is available to universities in, in this country, I think, will just continue to be under pressure. So I think changes are disruptive. Um, I was asked what things are on our radar screen here a little bit more parochially. Well, first of all, I have to say, as with Regents College, and I said in my kind of advertisement this morning, if you forgive me for being so talking my book so much in, in the opening remarks, but we again at University of London International Programmes, as my colleague Tim Gore has just mentioned, just seeing continued growth, continued uh, uh, increased, we're not a private company, we're part of a registered charity, but seeing increased <coughs> surplus generation which we can put to work for the 
uh, objectives of the university. So from the position of where we are, it's actually not necessarily an unpleasant kind of disruption, but I think for the system as a whole, it is. And just to mention just a few things that we're seeing, first of all, clearly increased market entry by new players, some of whom are, are represented here and have um, talked about what they're doing. Um, another theme from this morning that I think is very important is an increased consumerist approach. Um, not only are students going to feel much more consumers because they're feeling that they're paying themselves, they've also got a government that's telling them to be consumerist and I, I understand that that's going to be one of the sections of the higher education bill, consumer protection. So uh, I think that's going to have a big effect on universities that we've got to, I mean, quite scary the idea that the students' union can call in a QAA spot inspection of you in the way that might be done with a, an Ofsted inspection. I'm not sure if that's necessarily going to happen, but I, I think that would scare many, many vice chancellors and deans. And um, just two other points before I shut up. One is, uh, again, picking up a theme that from the whole day is there seems to be a consensus that more technology is going to be used, but not necessarily that we really know how to use it. And the very interesting observation from Kelvin about the Liverpool Laureate uh, experience, which seemed to be that it wasn't necessarily as technologically shiny, to use his words, as um, uh, some of what they're offering on campus. So uh, we're still feeling our way towards uh, appropriate models for using technology. And then finally, I'm here um, agreeing completely with uh, Geoffrey Crossett, my boss, um, that we're going to see a more diverse sector, more part-time, and probably fewer universities being able to sustain academics who are both doing teaching, scholarship, and research, and many more specialized institutions that are perhaps doing teaching and perhaps some scholarship, but not much research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just a couple of comments, really. Um, one is that I think, from my own perspective, disruption is an integral part of academic life. Uh, if you don't have disruption yeah. in terms of knowledge, you don't get new knowledge in that sense. So uh, the points that were made earlier around the fact that this is nothing new, um, to some extent, that is something that institutions have been grappling with uh, for a long period of time. I think one of the key issues which has been sort of alluded to but hasn't really been said is that often people talk around whether or not there's, uh, it's possible to talk about a sector. And I actually also think that there is a discussion to be had by what people mean by higher education and the fact and having a debate around higher education and what it is and, and, and how it works and how it operates doesn't in any way threaten the sense that it's going to be um, there as a, a sort of valuable contribution for the future. But it feels to me sometimes that there is a lack of discussion about different types of higher education. It's often different types of provider or different types of um, output or, or different things. But there's almost the sense that if you start talking about higher education and breaking it down into um, a, a, a debate about what it is and what it's for, that suddenly this whole sort of infrastructure will just collapse and, and, and disappear. And I think the reality of it is that in terms of um, the things that are impacting on the sector, uh, everybody's talked about it uh, before, there is an assumption that there will be uh, funding from somewhere, whether it's from a government or whether it's from a, 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 an individual or whether it's from a company to be able to uh, pay for access to higher education in the future. And uh, clearly what's happening in terms of the wider economic environment must be causing uh, some degree of concern. But I still think that uh, the long-term purpose of academic life, however that's uh, conceived, is around the development of knowledge, development of new knowledge and development of new thinking. And I think the single biggest challenge for institutions at this time is going to be how to be optimistic and fleet of foot in the short term but protect the long-term interests of their institution for the long term. Because the key thing is that uh, everyone wants to be in a position that there are not necessarily equivalent people, um, appropriate people for the right time, but that in 20 years' time that there are going to be people who can uh, have the uh, luxury and the uh, benefit to be able to have this sort of uh, discussion. So if there is one 
cautionary thing around disruption is that it does encourage people to think about the immediate, but actually the thing that should be on the minds of anyone who's got a serious interest in higher education is long-term stewardship and the contribution that it makes to society. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Uh, on the floor, are there, is there what, anybody got a factor that they think will be particularly disruptive or a position on this debate about are these disruptive times or, uh, or inevitable realities? Anybody want to volunteer a thought or a challenge, Drummond? Sorry, mind coming? Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with my successor as president of Universities UK that as things stand at the moment, uh, I don't think it's as disruptive as the media would uh, have us believe. Um, however, I do think there are two um, um, two bombs, whether they're ticking or not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, one of them is what the government does with the 20,000 students it's taking out of core and margin for the traditional providers. If that becomes 40,000, if that becomes 60,000, and if genuinely that is a bidding war based on price, that is going to change things quite radically over the next few years. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And the second one is the long term, and Eric did mention this, is the long term instability of the loan situation. I mean, um, People often ask me, um, you know, because of where I come from, how can Scotland possibly afford to actually uh, have free education when England can't? And of course the implication of the question is that somehow or other the Barnett formula is actually paying for it. But of course the Barnett formula isn't paying for it. Um, the, the simple answer is that the uh, uh, Scottish government hands over the money to the universities, whereas the English government hands the money over to the students. Um, and that conveniently takes it, of course, uh, off the public sector borrowing requirement. So from an accounting point of view, uh, <laughs> it's lovely. The money simply disappears. Uh, but the big question is, will it ever return? And some of the assumptions which the government have made about the return they're actually going to get, uh, given that this is discounted over 30 years, don't seem to me to make very much sense. And in, 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 as I say, in cash flow terms, the, the Scottish and English situation is exactly the same, um, more or less, give or take. Uh, and so what's going to happen longer term uh, in England, I think, is, is a very big question. Uh, and some people say, you know, the big issue is about can Scotland continue to provide free, free education. My question is, can England, in fact, afford to provide the kind of student support it can, it's doing at the moment? And I, my rather fear the answer to that question is no. And so again, I think with Eric in the next parliament, I don't think it'll happen in this parliament for obvious political reasons, but in the next parliament, we're going to be right back where we are at the moment uh, and with a much bigger bang because the, uh, the government is going to realise that actually the sums just don't matter. Thank you. That's a powerful public consideration. Ava, I want to get your perspective on that, if that's all right. Given that most European higher education is still provided either free or very low cost to students. If Drummond raised the question of how sustainable this position is in the UK, can you give us a perspective from Europe? <laughs> well, I don't know about <clears throat> Europe. I can also, I mean, in general, but I think he's absolutely right that um, the question is, is out there. And defaulting on loans is extremely high in countries that do have high indebtedness of, of students. So um, I think you're right that um, it seems inconceivable to us outsiders that there wasn't that kind of modeling done beforehand. But I think you're right that the bomb is ticking. Um, in, in continental Europe, um, fees are being discussed, and therefore um, loans and, and con contingent uh, provision of funding is being discussed, but very, very slowly because the impact um, politically um, is huge. I was just saying how in Sweden they introduced fees for international students um, for the first time and they saw a drop from 16,000 students to 1,800 students in one year. Um, Germany, which <coughs> introduced fees um, in two or three lender, moved back to free higher education in two of those three. So it's a, it's a slow process. My concern was that other countries look at Britain, as they did during the Thatcher period, and emulate what you've done. 
um, which I think would be very dangerous. But given the position of the UK higher education, as <coughs> we've been told many times at the top, as one of the best, um, sure, uh, other countries and other governments are looking at what the UK has done and quite potentially will think, hmm, this is a good way to go. To me, knowing that these bombs are ticking is um, something to, to keep in mind. Thank you. So I'll just take up the issue of the, the loans. And I, I think it's not right to compare the student loan scheme in this country with student loans in other countries. For example, the states. I mean, in the states, their private loans are high interest rate, and the day you graduate, they chase you, they hound you to death. And that's why there are so many big problems in the states um, from students who've taken up these loans. I know, I bailed my daughter out who took out one of these loans in the states. Um, I think, as well, if we take Europe, um, I was visiting one of our Spanish partners in Madrid recently, and they were saying, so what are the new fees going to be in Britain? And I said, well, you know, at the top end around about 10,000 euros. They said, oh, that's outrageous. You know, we only charge 400 euros here. And then I thought, and that's why your economy is going down the pan. Because, in essence, you're having to borrow the money from the rest of Europe in order to fund not just your education system and so on. But before long, they're going to find that they can't continue to fund at the current level. And there's going to be some kind of evening out on this, I think. Okay, I, I, having, having to take other points of view, but also I've given our limited time. I'm not going to force our way down the panel and back again each time, if that's okay, but if you want to dive in, just wave your hand at me. Uh, a question at the back, David? Sorry, behind you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Law. I work at Shell University. Um, a fascinating day and fascinating discussion now. Uh, do we live in disruptive times? Literally, yes. I mean, surely that's all admit. We live in very disruptive times for higher education. At my university, actually, we're not particularly worried about that because we think that disruption is a very good thing because we think there's too much status hierarchy in higher education and dynamic universities like Edgefield may well benefit. But more importantly, I think we are, as a country, engaged on a massive experiment, an absolutely massive experiment, and nobody knows whether this experiment is going to succeed. Um, other countries may look at us and think this is something that should be emulated. I think there are still further countries that look at us and say, why on earth is Britain doing this? <laughs> Britain has a, a, a reputation for an extremely high quality higher education system that is the envy of the world. I've just come back from three weeks in China, and when I've tried to explain to Chinese colleagues about the new system in the UK, they throw up their hands in horror. Now, China has a very dynamic and diverse higher education system with all sorts of private influences uh, within it. And there's nothing wrong, in my view, about having more privatization in higher education. What I think we simply have not understood is what the long-term implications are going to be. And I'll run through some of those just briefly. Uh, one of those is that uh, we have no idea what is going to happen to graduate education in this country. Absolutely no idea about what the impact of undergraduate fees is going to be on graduate education. That's something that panel members might want to, 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 to pick up. Um, secondly, we have no real idea about uh, the subject balance that we're going to have in universities in future. Uh, there are going to be subjects which can be seriously threatened uh, by this. There are other subjects which perhaps won't be threatened in terms of existence, but nevertheless very important in terms of, of cultural inheritance, uh, English, history, and so on. Will students be prepared to pay for those subjects? So those are two examples, I think, of issues which have not yet been thought through. But my fundamental point is that nobody knows whether this is going to work. And I think Drummond's point about uh, loans and default on loans is absolutely vital. It doesn't really matter that the loan system is fundamentally different from the United States, because actually uh, what we pledge to do is to fund universities in the future through a loan system. And with the Treasury um, predicting that there will be a 70, only 70% 70 repayment, and most authorities saying this is far too high, I wonder really what state we're going to be in in 30 or 40 years' time. Pick up on a, a couple of issues there. <laughs> I think uh, your visit to China is interesting, and I think you probably agree that domestic 
quality of supply in China is raising all the time. One of the things about um, the saviors of British higher education that I constantly hear is that it's going to be in international education, international students. It always has been. We've always had a substantial number. But we're in grave danger at the moment of destroying that market. I think the Chinese, if you speak to them in this country, at the embassy, will say they're getting fed up with British universities doing nothing for Chinese students. And the same is true of many other nationalities as well. One of the things we need to do is get a grip on what it is that we mean by international education and the care that we spend in looking after those students when they come here. The visa issue hasn't been mentioned much today. It was um, briefly mentioned uh, um, this afternoon. The visa issue, actually, I think is a rather positive thing. I mean, I, I constantly hear universities say how awful that it is that we're going to clamp down on visas. Most universities aren't going to be clamped down on visas. Who's going to be clamped down on visas? It's the people delivering, in the main, very poor quality higher education, which damages the UK. And you can see it in some of the actions that have been taken in this last week by some of those colleges who sold out, got out, ripped off students. I think that if we get it right, the university system will be able to benefit from the changes in the visa allocations. Yep, well, I think one, just to pick up on a point of, of um, the, the, the uh, role that international students play in the economic viability of UK institutions is not new, but UK is not new or alone in counting on international students for the viability. And I think that there's a limit to the massive recruitment of international students as a way to recover um, the, the, the gap of public funding. And I think that backlash is, is not too, too far away from coming. Um, in addition, I think the, if you look at the numbers and the trends in those three million international students that are mobile, the numbers are shifting. And they are shifting towards new providers. New countries uh, are gaining faster, uh, I hate to use this, but the market share of those three million students. So the competition is going to be huge. And I think, um, one of the most important challenges will be to provide an experience to the international students that is full of value. They cannot be cash cows. They need to be, become part of the learning experience. And that's not easy to do. Um, Australia has had um, a very long experience of having too many students in ghettos and not being able to or not absorbing them properly into the educational system. So I think we need to be careful uh, not to overstate this as a way to recover funding, but really make it a part of the educational experience um, from which UK students learn as much as the students who come. And maybe that will attract UK students to go abroad as well, because that's the other thing, the imbalance. You wanted to jump in. Well, I, I just wanted to really agree with the previous two speakers. I think that volume is not really the game when it comes to international students. Um, we've had mention just now of uh, uh, ghettos of students all from one part of the world who probably don't get a very rich experience because they are present in such large numbers relative to other international students. And I have to say on some courses I've observed even to, to domestic students. So I, I think we should be looking for quality and recognizing the point that Eva's made, that it's becoming a more multidimensional world. As I travel a lot to the, to the Far East, not just to, to China, but to places like Malaysia and Singapore, one sees a great deal of evidence of, for example, students from Africa ending up um, in Malaysia. And I, I can see for many of them it's, it's actually a more appropriate and, and more interesting place to be. Many of their investment, they're going to the countries that are the origin of the investment flows into their region now, understanding more about China and the greater Chinese world is, is very important for them. Um, I would also like to repeat the point I made in, in, our, in my opening remarks, which is when you um, consider our concerns about the poorer countries in the world, the international student experience that is offered here is an elite experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're looking at um, at the very least, to be an undergraduate education, 60, 70, 80,000 pounds, 
um, for countries where you know per capita income is you know 1,500 pounds, and in many African countries it's less than that. We're kidding ourselves if we think we're doing, if you like, good in the world by offering these opportunities for small numbers of people who come from the existing political and commercial elites in that world. We're really just validating their elite status by the fact they can buy themselves into quite good sounding UK universities and go home and continue to, to um, reinforce their elite positions. And I'm, for that reason, very proud of when I travel to see what we're able to do with University of London international programs because whilst I wouldn't in any way claim that we get through to the poorest of the poor, we can put on programs that get people very good, high standard, demanding degrees. As I said this morning, at a tenth, I think, and that's probably not overstating a case, it could be even less, but a tenth of the cost of the same provision here. So, so I think that we need to think differently about internationalization, and particularly from the UK, we should be confident about, as long as we've got the models correct, as my colleague Tim Gore was pointing out just now, should be confident about doing more in, if you like, other countries and not thinking of it always as a sort of opportunity for people to come and live here for a while. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to, now, the, if there are other burning issues that you want us to pick up, uh, now is probably the time to tell me, because what I'm going to suggest is for the uh, last part of this, um, uh, of this uh, concluding session, that I take this, we take the second half of the theme for today, which is emerging models. I think so. We've, we've started to um, we've spent some time addressing disruptive times, yes or no. But in terms of emerging models, perhaps we look at it in this sense: in terms of differences in provision. And I'm going to ask each of the panel members, from their own professional perspective, to say uh, to, to tell us what they think. Is there going to be a specific difference in provision in the next five years? I'm going to start, Ken, by asking you in terms of shared services, partnerships, collaborations. Um, Jonathan, perhaps thinking from the perspective of modes of delivery, ever inevitably a global perspective would be great. And, um, and Alvin, perhaps in terms of differences in provision, private and public private, um, as a way of making sure that we address those particular, that, that particular part of the theme. Ken, can you start off? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, um, I think in reality, if we were to go forward uh, five years, I think there will be. Uh, significantly different models uh, in relation to the professional side of the way in which universities run. I think that will happen for a number of reasons. One, because there will be continued cost pressure on institutions, but cost pressure to deliver high quality. So in reality, institutions are going to have to ensure that if they are spending resources on professional services that they're getting the full value of those uh, resources in, in that sort of way. Um, the debate as to whether or not there'll be a shift between sort of individual institutions just running things better, uh, shared services between institutions, uh, private public partnerships, uh, I think right across that spectrum you will see it as part of the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, running or, or, of the institution. And I think the reason for that will come down to some very simple economies which are that the thing that makes a university a university is the fact that it is in the provision of a high quality academic, vocational, professional experience, teaching, research, whatever the mission is of the individual institution. Um, and will want to ensure that as much of its investment internal uh, resources can go in the delivery of that. Um, I'm not saying that you would see a sort of mass cutting back on the professional side. I just think the professional side will have to do um, significantly better in some areas with less resource. Um, and that will inevitably uh, lead to a pooling of capability and uh, a, a pooling of approach. And I, the only thing I would hope, and, and it's happened very quickly already, um, when I was in an institution, the private sector was often seen as the thing over there. And, um, and it was often described in a, a language which was somewhat unflattering and uh, a much bigger threat than I think I've, I've ever found it to uh, be. Um, and I would just hope that uh, conversations around uh, different sectors and how they work together uh, over the next five years, that that will just become part of normal discourse. And the reality of it is it all comes down to individual institutions or groups of institutions having the confidence to make the right choice for what they want to do but, um, and getting away from 
uh, any sort of uh, overstatement of the difference between the different sectors because I'm, I'm not sure that's helpful. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, John. Well, if I had put my finger on one key factor, I think it would be technology. I said a few minutes ago that we don't quite know how to use technology, but we can see various components developing. Um, online university libraries. You, having good quality university libraries is a very expensive business. Now, students who enroll with programs that pay the appropriate licenses and manage the front end of the student access well can give students very rich resources. Um, the same applies to a whole range of teaching materials and increasingly with bandwidth uh, developing and blossoming everywhere in the world, there's much greater possibility for genuinely good classroom and, and shared experiences online. So I think all of that is going to, to make a huge difference and the, the prizes will go, and probably are beginning to go already, but they will go for those who can put all that together well. Um, i just give one example, if I can, of the, the power of this. I, earlier somebody mentioned uh, MIT's Open Courseware project, and I had the privilege of visiting that about five years ago, so I may be a bit out of date, but the period I was visiting them, they had a map on the wall showing the thickness of the bandwidth with other parts of the world with which they were connected, and the um, place in the world which was most wired in other than the United States was the UK. But the big surprise to me was the second biggest place was Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, that solved for me some of the puzzle of the very high quality and engaged Nigerian professionals that I meet and the reality of rather parlous state of the Nigerian visit universities that I tend to visit. There are a huge number of people, I think, self-educating in Nigeria and with extraordinarily high quality materials provided by MIT. So, you know, there, there are literally thousands of Nigerian students who sit down every day and look at MIT syllabuses, look at MIT lectures, and look at a whole range of MIT online resources. Now, they don't necessarily get credentials as a consequence of that. They probably use it for working towards the credentials of their own domestic universities. But it's a pointer to the way things may be going. Thank you, Jonathan. Ava. From a global perspective, it is, it's impossible to answer, but one of the things that I would say, just, just a remark about MIT and open educational resources, mm. I looked at a similar map um, after they put their courseware yeah. online. What struck me was the number or the places in the world yeah. that most visited, and the top was Iran. The number okay. one yeah. hits from yeah. on, on the, in the first six weeks of the uh, MIT uh, uh, putting things online was Iran, which was very surprising yeah. to me. What I was going to say is um, that there will be, uh, as far as I can see, a huge diversity of provision. I think um, higher education is extremely innovative. Uh, I, I believe that um, we have barely scratched the uh, surface of the various models that can be invented and put together. When you then join it with a profit model, profit motive of the private sector, you've got an infinite um, set of possibilities. My concern, because I think that one of the things that we should also look at is what potential concerns we may have, is I think that we will have an incredibly um, hierarchical ecosystem in higher education in country and between countries. When I look at how universities choose their partners today, internationally, they look at brand, they look at reputation, and they go strength to strength, they will say, and excellence to excellence. But it means that there are institutions that are being left out because they don't have that uh, capacity to attract. Um, and I think there will be systems where you have a very, very hierarchical and, and very stratified system, um, which, which I don't think is, is a positive thing. Second point I would make is that I think we're going to have a very difficult time keeping the three missions of higher education or three missions of universities tightly integrated as we all wish. Um, because I can't see how um, the public responsibility or the outreach um, and research can, uh, can easily be meshed with a demand and consumer-led 
um, higher education. So we have to be very careful that our provision um, keeps these concerns um, in mind and, and uh, we have some checks and balances uh, to, uh, to protect what we think is a, a, a value of universities. Thank you. Thank you. Over. <coughs> Firstly, I'd just like to say how envious I am of uh, London International. But I, I think the opportunity to do things that are of benefit to this country and a lot of other countries as well is quite extraordinary. And I think there are other opportunities for many other players in the UK Asian sector to go outside the UK now. And I think the mention was made earlier on the fact that the government has finally woken up to the fact that HE is a major part of the UK economy and is looking to put backing and support behind institutions who want to establish themselves elsewhere. There's even going to be something like an export credit guarantee department um, for higher education in the future. So I think that's very positive. I, I hope it's not just going to be online. I mean, online is fantastic, it's got its place, but it does have to be the use of technology in a sensible way, as was described just now. Access to libraries, access to a whole series services, communications, and so on. But for the total university experience, it's by no means enough. It may be all that people in some areas can get. Um, I did a big online experiment done putting online education at degree level into Welsh Hill Farms. It was all they could get in Welsh Hill Farms. And it works, but it's not the same kind of experience. I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration, as has been said all day, between the public and the private sector in terms of partnerships for a wide variety of different aspects of our provision, whether it's back office functions, whether it's um, parts of the, the, the profile. From my institution, we want to stay as a private, not-for-profit institution. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to collaborate with the for-profit sector, where it makes sense to us, perhaps, being able to go further and faster than otherwise we'd be able to do. I think we are going to have troubles in meeting the, the, the multiple um, objectives of universities, and I think, um, in a sense, research is one of those. I was quite taken, it had not occurred to me before today, about the fact that the number of research active people being paid for is going up in this country in terms of the number of students being taught. Now, whether that's a sensible expenditure of money, I need to go away and think about that, but perhaps we should be focusing um, research monies in a better way and making sure that we've got excellence in teaching and education alongside that.